welcome back to my second talk. 2,000 lines of Java or 50 lines of SQL, the choice is yours. And do also notice the subtitle which is on the top. Exactly. We're going to talk about some real SQL. So we've already seen a couple of these slides, I can just skip them. I repeat my jokes because they're so funny. Here actually I have the solution to the other one. So in case any one of you is ever wondering about how to recover from this uh, misery, it's with as of timestamp if you're using Oracle. DB2 has a similar feature. They call it time travel queries. Very uh, sophisticated, so you can go back time of your table. We've had that, we've had that, we've had the JPA rant. Really, just everything is the same. I should find a couple of new jokes. Big data, what is it? Is this big data? Or is this big data? Hackers steal billions of internet data. Or is this big data? Who knows who this is? This is the 10 Gen logo, so MongoDB. The reign of the relational databases over. Yeah, right. And actually, this is what's going to happen, right? People said that before. The relational database is over. We're going to do object databases. Anyone remember those? Anyone remember XML databases? Anyone use them still? So I'm going to say this guy is going to win. The guy on the left there. Big data, no SQL meetup in Hamburg. No more Larry Ellison. Right. So okay, we've done all of that stuff. Let's talk about SQL. Right. So the, the talk before was, okay, now we've um, had the introduction of this talk. It would have been is big data and no SQL important? No, it's not. So let's talk about SQL. And you can write SQL in Java. So before we only focus on Juke, obviously you don't always have to use Juke. If in a very lightweight situation, you might use something like JDBC directly or Apache Commons, DB Utils, or Spring has a JDBC template. Or there's a one very uh, interesting API who is using MyBatis here or has been using it before. No one? A little bit? So the interesting thing here is that you can actually use it as a templating engine, so you just, not everyone agrees that you should embed your SQL in Java code, sometimes people think it's better to put it outside of your Java code, but not in the database for some reason, so I would then, if it's not in Java code, put it in views and store procedures, but these folks think it's a nice idea to have it in files with your Java code, so you can patch it in runtime at production, the DBA can patch your Java and your SQL files, that's my bad this. So, yeah, we have SQL in Java, this is JDBC again. Interesting thing about Groovy, so when you're doing Groovy, you can write a SQL statement like this. This is really awesome, so then you have the SQL object, you can call each row, this executes the SQL statement, it takes the parameter, and there's a second implicit kind of parameter, that's this curly braces thing, that's a Groovy Lambda expression, short syntax form, and it takes the result set, it iterates over each result, and you can string interpolate, uh, you can use string interpolation to dereference columns within a string from your result set. So you can't get any more concise with SQL than with Groovy, but not type safe. But if type safety is not important, this might be fine. If type safety is important, we have had this talk before. And now about SQL itself. So when should you use SQL? Now we're all Java developers and we're not, maybe not very inclined to use SQL every day. Often we, we're better at Java. We do that every day and after it's easier. We also do JPA and after that's easier than SQL if you're not used to it. But there are a couple of indicators when you should not use neither Java nor JPA but SQL. And one of those is you need a lot of joins or unions. So you have a lot of set operations. When you're thinking in sets, People have far forgotten about this, especially in enterprise Java development. Everyone does uh, some CRUD and some, some single row uh, operations, but why not think about sets? So we've heard streams. Streams do everything lazily. Stream processing is a very interesting aspect of Java development in modern times. You can actually operate on streams in a similar fashion as with sets. You don't care about the order in which the stream appears to you. You just tell the stream this is how I want to transform individual rows. And depending on the implementation of the stream or on the flags that you pass it, it can decide itself in what order or if it wants to bulk execute stuff or whatever. So 
this is extremely useful already in streams and in SQL it's even better because you only say this is the result I want to have. It has these properties. These columns, these predicates, that's what I want to have. Database, find it out yourself. And declarative programming has always been a very, very interesting concept and the only programming language that has really took, took, um, took off with declarative programming is SQL because of these reasons. So whenever you think in sets, and you also have the third bullet, when you do bulk reads and writes, you also think in sets, you should use SQL. And when you use a lot of functions and aggregations, you should also use SQL. So in my opinion, calculations should be done close to the data. And that's something that's going to happen again. So things always oscillate in, in our hype-based industry. So people started doing everything on the mainframe. Then they thought, okay, applets is the new thing. So we started doing everything on the client. Then they put everything back on Java Enterprise Edition servers. And now we're putting everything back on the browser again. I'm going to say you as I told you before, with memory being so cheap, you better do everything in the server, server again in the next five years. That's my prediction. And calculations should be done close to data because you want to avoid network latency as much as possible. That's going to kill you in highly parallel applications when you do these big data models and these big data things with, uh, with uh, servers with many concurrent connections. You might want to consider doing stuff close to the data because then you can avoid the I.O. That's just one thing. But I'm not uh, experienced in these areas, so I, I'm just saying what I read. Please just think about doing the calculation in that database. Just a little bit of more convincing here. Please do that calculation in the database. All right. A little bit of SQL trivia because this time we're not going to talk about Java. We're going to talk about SQL. And I want to get your minds up and running again on the SQL topic. Can anyone tell me what we get from this query here? What will it return? Any ideas? Return one, or two, or three, or one and two? Who in here is for one? That would be wrong, huh? Who in here is for two? A couple of you. Who in here is for three? No, just. Who in here is for, it doesn't return anything? You're just guessing wildly, huh? Aren't you? Okay. I'm going to explain. So, this is the point here. One in null. It's the first predicate. So, this obviously doesn't return anything, right? It wouldn't make sense if this returned anything. Because 1 is not in a, in a list of rep values where null is inside. But the bottom one, the bottom predicate, is the inverse of the top one. So this one should return a value, right? Do you think so? No. Problem here is this query could be rewritten as this one. Now we have 1 equal null the top one and one not equal null in the bottom one. Trouble with SQL null is it's not the same thing as Java null. The Java null means the value has not been initialized. So it is absent. And you know it is absent. There is no value. In SQL, Java, uh, SQL null doesn't mean there is no value. It actually means we don't know the value. There is always a value, but we don't know it. So when you see null in SQL, always think unknown. So we have two times unknown. We don't know if there's a value or not. So we don't get any value from this query. This is mean because here we still understand, okay, this makes sense. Right? So we can't compare one with null as equality. We don't know if one is null. It could be one, it could be two. The null value. But not equal is more subtle. We can always, we can even not tell if one is not equal to null. So we also don't know the answer to that one. So there are three kinds of Boolean values in SQL. There's true, there's false, and there's null. And that's very tough to understand at first, especially if you in this situation where it was really not obvious. You seem to have inverse predicates, but that's not true. They're actually not the exact inverse of each other. And the bottom one is very tough. If you have a bind variable in an in list, in a not in list, 
and you think, okay, I just put my Java bind variables in there. I have one, two, and not. And you put that in a not in list, and your whole not in predicate will evaluate to unknown. Because the SQL engine cannot know if the value is in this in list, because it doesn't know the last value, which is null. So you will never get a result. Anyone had this happen to them before? This is very, very mean, because the Java null value is something different from the SQL null value, but it is mapped as one to one. More trivia. Let's talk about Oracle. Who in here uses Oracle? No? A little bit? What, what do you guys use? Postgres? MySQL? SQL Server? Postgres mostly? H2 of it. But this is ARC. What do you think this will return? So who actually thinks this will return 1? No. Who thinks this will return 2? No. 1 and 2? Maybe? That would be reasonable, no? But it is ARC. And in Oracle, the empty string those brittle minds thought the empty string is the same as null. So what they did is this, right? Does it return anything? No, it doesn't. Only in Oracle. So everyone in here can laugh at you and me because we're using Oracle in this case. Now if this were bind variables again, you don't even see that in your kind of code because you're comparing a value with a value and you kind of feel it makes sense. Because you didn't put null in it, you, you remember from the last example, you put the empty string, but no, in Oracle, it's still not. Okay. I have the Stockholm Syndrome slide again. Ha ha ha. This one again. Okay, so I introduced you to SQL. Uh, once when I gave this talk, yeah, actually, this is how, how this uh, came to be, this slide. Once when I gave this talk, so why are we even using SQL? It's so horrible. Yeah, Cobalt, uh, Stockholm Syndrome. SQL has a very long history and they've made their own mistakes, but SQL is also really awesome. So we've talked about running totals before, I've explained how it works. These are the same slides and now we're going to see how we can do it. There are various ways to do it. I'm going to walk you through all of them. So how can we do it, apart from what we've seen before? Do you have other ideas? I mean, obviously the window functions are not the only way to solve these kind of problems. How would you do it? Don't say Java. I'm going to solve this one. So you could obviously do it with Java. You could calculate the balance on update, either with Java or with the store procedure, and then write it in there. That's probably useful when you have an accounting system and you must never change values again. You could do it with a nested select. You could do it with recursive SQL. Oh my god, who has done this before? Recursive SQL. Nightmare, every DBA developer. The window functions example we've already seen. There is a model clause only in Oracle, so this is going to be very awesome. Too bad for you guys, you don't have that. You're going to download Oracle Express tomorrow, the free edition, and try that tomorrow. Tonight. Tonight. Yeah, no, I think we're going to eat uh, yeah, dinner. Just, after. just after dinner. I have it on my laptop if you want to play. And you can do it with store procedures, but we're not going to look at these obvious choices. We're going to look at the SQL choices. So let's do the nested select example. And I will upload the slides again. So you can review that if you still feel like it after the examples. So nested select, it's actually very easy. Again, we read the front class first where we have the transactions. We select that, we filter by account ID, and then we transform it with the select clause. And it's actually almost the same query as the window function query, except that we're using an aggregate function this time in a subselect. So when you don't have window functions, you could transform your SQL, your window function, into subselect with some rules. So this is how it works. We're going to look at the example more in depth. First off, we want to, remember, we want to calculate the sum of all the rows on top of the current row. So this is how we calculate it. We consider the other order by clause. 
So it's ordering by validate descendingly and then by ID descendingly. So we're using the same ordering also in this predicate that I highlighted here. And now I'm using these Rova expression predicates, which is an awesome feature. So now I understand why you're all using it, because you're using Postgres, which is in this respect the most advanced database of all. It supports all the SQL standards. Oracle doesn't support, I think, greater than on window and on uh, row value expressions, I believe. Some predicates are supported, this one is not. Um, again, what this means is we're comparing two values with each other. And it, is, it makes a lot of sense when you emulate it. So when you emulate it, if you don't have this in your database, like H2 doesn't have it, uh, or they don't implement it correctly, because when you write uh, a list of values, then it thinks it's an array, not a row value expression. But when you compare these things, the greater than transforms into first comparing the value date. And only if the value date is not bigger than the other one, then it compares the value date again, looks if they're the same, and compares then the second one, the second column. So again, if you look at the order by column, uh, clause, it actually does the same thing as order by. That is very consistent in SQL. So when you order by, you, com you order by the first value first, and only if they're the same within that bucket, you order by the second column. That's the same thing with the predicate. And I've shown you this before. This is how we do the sum. We calculate the sum of all the values on top and subtract that from the current balance. So who, who in here thinks that this will be a good idea in terms of performance? You do? What database did you use? Postgres. Oracle? Yeah. Postgres? Postgres? I haven't tried on Postgres. But I can tell you on Oracle, the way I did, it was not a good idea. So this is an execution plan, and um, it's a very good idea to learn how to read these things. Who reads these things on a daily basis when you write SQL? No? Who has ever read an execution plan? Yeah, a couple of you, at least. That's good. I don't know how sophisticated they are in Postgres. I've never run uh, Postgres in production. Uh, with Oracle, it's actually very, very informative, and this is not even the, the most informative part. I've skipped that out. Um, that would be below, but they're all kind of the same. So an execution plan actually describes the algorithm that the database chose to use to implement your query. And there are a couple of operations on each column and on each row of the algorithm. And what I did here in the example is I used 10,000 sample rows in the database and I filtered by this account ID equal one, which returned 1,101 rows. You can see this on line number nine, which is actually the first, um, the first statement in the algorithm that is executed. On line number nine, we do an index range scan on this index that actually helps us filter by account ID. So this is obviously very quick. That's just going to show you how, how long this took. And then it bubbles up and does a couple of things. And then on line number three, on ID number three, we have this strange uh, index range scan, again, on the same column. And it runs with an actual rows value of 1.2 million. So what I display here is the operation, the name of the object that is being used. And A rows means actual rows, and A time means actual time of the execution. So I, I set my Oracle um, plan uh, display to, to display the actual rows and the actual time, not the estimates. The estimates may be off, so I really was interested in how long it really takes. And remember, I only had 1,000 rows. How can there be suddenly 1.2 million rows in, the, in, the, in memory of the execution plan? The reason is, this algorithm has gone quadratic on me. So for every row, I actually did the whole select again and selected all the rows again. Horrible implementation. This is quadratic for something that I could have done in a, in a linear time. Because I actually have to, trans I have to load all the rows only once, right? Theoretically, it should be possible. Now, I didn't do a lot of time, I didn't spend a lot of time tuning this thing. I just added this one index. Uh, this is obviously a good choice, but probably I could tune it in a way that it would be optimized by Oracle. 
I'm not so sure about MySQL, perhaps Postgres, but generally you should think about nested selects as nested loops. Most of the time the database cannot transform the nested loop into something more efficient like a merge join or something like that or a hash join. So a nested loop may be expensive. Probably is. That's not, that doesn't mean that the nested select is always bad, but the nested loop caused by aggregation in nested select is often bad. Nested selects in, in the front clause can be much better than this. So that was the first solution. Oh, by the way, the time, the actual time. So when you see an Oracle execution plan, the minimum time that is displayed is 10 milliseconds. That's the minimum time displayed. Probably it's, it's even less than a millisecond. Don't ever think that 21, 210 milliseconds, as in the red line, is anything near fast. So your database should always be in the lowest range when you execute a query in development time. You should never have any query that goes beyond that. Because your database can, and then this is certainly not fast, especially for the 1,000 rows. So, recursive SQL. Are you guys still awake? This is going to be tough. So, in order to calculate this query recursively, and there is such a thing in SQL, I prepared the database in a different way. I actually added this transaction number in the example. This makes recursion just much simpler. So I ordered all the uh, transactions by uh, a number. Discrete increasingly number. So this is how I calculate the number. with a row number with a window function. I've covered this before. We will go into that again. And this is a, just a view, so I just have this table like a view, so I have the readily calculated transaction number all the time. Now this is recursive SQL. Ladies and gentlemen, a lot of stuff in here. First off, the with clause. Has anyone ever used that? Postgres? It's really awesome. The with clause per se is really awesome. It's actually the only way you can define variables in SQL, in the standard. Some databases also do define variables. That's never a standard. With is the only standard way to define a table variable. So with is also called a common table expression, which means you have a table expression which you can reuse all the time in the query. It's like a variable for a table. It's like a view, but it is only scoped for this one single query. In Postgres, you can use it with uh, select, update, insert, delete. Uh, in most databases, you can only use it with select. It's extremely useful. And in this case, it's used for recursive query. And how does it work, recursive query? Now, we have the with clause, which declares a view. And we call this ordered with balance. Then we have union all, and that's mandatory. For whatever reason they chose this particular syntax, I don't know, but union all is mandatory for recursive SQL. And it must have two subselects. The first subselect of union all defines your recursion seed. So when you recurse, you select just the seed in the first subselect from the original table, transactions by time. Remember where I added the transaction number. And in the second subselect of the union all, you specify how to recurse, given the seed. Now, when you look closely, I select from ordered with balance. That's the view I'm about to declare. I'm actually selecting from the view that I'm declaring within. That's how recursion works. I mean, they could have probably found a much, much simpler syntax than this, but that's how it works. And you can only select, uh, select it only once in the from class, and it has to be even the first, I think, before all the other joins. And then you join the recursion criteria. You join the table you're really selecting from again. So you join this transactions by time table. That's the first step of recursion. The second one, and now you see why I use the transactions number to simplify the example. In the first subselect, the balance is the current balance. 
Remember, I've pre-calculated that somewhere, so I can just use it. The first row is the transaction number equal 1. That's my seed. I want to start recursing with the first transaction. That's kind of like a constant. I can just use the current balance and transaction number equal 1. And then the next row, and every recursive next row, will be T2 balance, where T2 is the recursive table, ordered by balance T2, minus T2 amount, so that's, remember, from the display of the, of the table. So that's how we calculate the balance on each row. And the recursion is specified by the joint criteria, where we say, okay, I just want to have the one next transaction. You, you, does it make sense now, more or less? So you're actually joining the same table five times because we had five transactions. This is how you, you actually joining this stuff, so at least syntactically, it makes sense. You would be able to calculate each balance if you explicitly joined it five times. It would just go on forever. You can't write that much SQL to go on indefinitely. With this syntax here, you can write the join logic and the database engine optimizes it into some recursive uh, or iterative sometimes algorithm. So it makes some sense. It is really the SQL way of doing it. Uh, in Oracle, Informix, and Kubrit, there's also a connect by clause, which does recursion a bit more easily. Uh, it's more intuitive, but it's less powerful than this. With this, you can do any sort of recursion. And it's extremely powerful. And then in the end, I didn't highlight it, but at the bottom, you just select from that recursive table after the with clause. So that was recursive SQL. If you're uh, not already scared, maybe you try that sometime. Recursive SQL can be fun for some use cases. But do you think it performs? No? I asked the question in a way that no is the only answer. It may perform, but usually it doesn't. In my example, this went really off horribly. And I have that number, 11 million rows in memory. Remember, all I wanted in the end was only 1,000 rows. Actually, I'm selecting 50 rows because I have, have used SQL uh, Developer here, and it had displayed only the first 50 rows, which you can see at the top. But there would actually be 1,000 rows. On line number two, you see 1,000 rows. Actual rows have been delivered by the view in the end after recursion, but at some, at some stage, I had those 11 million rows and the whole execution time was 35 seconds to calculate balances for 1,000 rows. So, not good. Part of the whole problem is obviously my calculation of the transaction number. I wouldn't do it this way in the real, in the real world. I would either pre-calculate that or probably do the recursion more on a more complex basis, but it would have been too difficult to explain on one slide. But the problem is, yes, you have a question? Uh, next to the ID, yes. uh, that's the part I told you before. The interesting part, the really interesting part is actually what has really happened on this line. And the star says there is actually an access to an object. No, there's actually additional information at the bottom. So you have um, an oracle, you have an execution plan, you, you can see, is, was this an index access or was it a filter? So could the index really be leveraged or was it scanned? So we have, for instance, the index range scan on line number seven will probably say, okay, this was not access, but scan, which is very slow. So when you do the analysis, this becomes important. But for the, to make the point, I, I left it out. Now, one interesting aspect is on line number 10, I have these 9,999, uh, 9, I should have to make 10,000 rows better pronounce it. So you have the, the whole set of rows that have been accessed from the transactions table. So my filter has never been applied really in this whole execution plan. I have a filter. I have an account ID filter down there, but the index wasn't used. And to this date, and even with Marcus Winnen, I've been talking about this, I haven't figured it out, but this has nothing to do with recursion. This has an oracle to do with union all. When you have a predicate and you apply the predicate 
to a derived table or a view or something like that with a union all in it, then the filter is not pushed down in the individual union subselects. I don't know why. It should be possible because if you repeat the filter in each of the subselects, it would be semantically the same query. And then the index would work and we would have a much better execution plan because we could filter out all the wrong uh, transactions. But actually the filter is applied much later on. Uh, now the star would be interesting again to, s to see when it is applied. Probably on line number two. Probably the filter is applied in line number two when we reduce the rows to 1000. So there's a lot of stuff going on. So SQL is... is um, when you have a commercial database, and a very sophisticated one, and Postgres is becoming more and more sophisticated, the execution planner is quite strong. Even MySQL, the MySQL folks at Oracle are now implementing a cost-based uh, cost optimizer, I think for MySQL 5.7 maybe. I'm not sure about the version, but they have a lot of knowledge that goes from Oracle to MySQL. They're also sharing the Oracle Ex um, Enterprise Manager with MySQL, so you can manage your MySQL instances with the Oracle Enterprise Manager. If you've ever used that tool, it's pure bliss for operations. So if you ever have to track down a productive uh, SQL problem in Oracle, you can go back 10 days and, and see exactly what happened in this query. And these are awesome tools, and cost-based optimizers are what make SQL today so strong. So when SQL was invented, it was a great concept, but no one knew how to implement it for about 20 years. I mean, they knew how to implement it in uh, some way, but not in an efficient way. And still some remains of this early days are, 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 are there today, like this filter push down that doesn't happen. So with recursive SQL, for instance, you always have the union all, and that always has a certain risk of further slowing things down, in Oracle at least. And uh, the whole query really just didn't execute well. I could have probably optimized this in one way or another, but You've seen the query, it was quite hard already for a very simple use case, so optimizing this is not going to be easy. The bottom line here on, on recursive SQL is you can do it, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. And uh, if you have a lot of these use cases, you're probably better off with a graph database that models recursion or, or traversal much better than a SQL database. If you only have one or two queries, one day, just remember this exists, pull it out, you will be able to optimize it. I mean, I didn't spend uh, more than 10 minutes in this query, then I gave up, but uh, it's possible, certainly. So this is just to show you it's possible. It's always awesome to think about the various ways how you can express similar requirements in SQL. There's always a possibility. The window function one would be the next one. So we've already seen the example, it's still the same one. Does anyone want a repetition as a refresher? Are you going to be quadratic on this one? I will show the execution plan. But I mean the repetition on the explanation, probably not, we remember. I have an even better, I have actually at the end of the talk an awesome, awesome window function example for Postgres. It runs only in Postgres. So will this perform. <coughs> yes, it will. All right, we have the best possible execution plan. We have the filter which is being applied, I mean the index is being applied on the line number six with the index range scan. Very quick, access by index. Then we have table access by index row ID which is quite quick as well and we reduce the whole result set on the nested loop to 11 100 records and we have the maximum time that can be displayed here on this kind of display without me optimizing anything. So I just added this one index and it's as fast as it could be. Pretty slick. So I've already shown the book advertisement. So now it's a little bit of anecdote time. In these cases we are bringing all the data actually to the general world let's say. Operation and the computation in Java. Yeah, now it's the perfect question for the anecdote. What will be the difference between this operation and the operation in Java? Okay, so I'm going to tell the full story and then answer your question. So, 
my love for window functions and for SQL really ignited a couple of uh, years ago when I did this assignment for a banking customer and they had a running total, obviously, and they did it in Java. And it was a horrible mess of 2,000 lines of Java code, which is also the title of this, uh, this talk. Horrible, horrible mess. Some guy did it and then they thought, oh, this is extremely slow on Oracle 8i or whatever, so we have to cache stuff. And then business came and said, oh, we have to redesign the screens and we have to have new order by clauses and new ways of filtering. They didn't think of that in the first place, so they had to add to those filters to the Java logic, but part of the Java logic was already externalized to the admin UI for the, for the bank uh, employees, not for the end users, which still works the old way, so what did they do? They had uh, no time, so they just copy-pasted the whole logic, as you always do, right? So you copy-paste and you rewrite that again. And actually, it got even worse. The whole thing needed to be re-implemented on an e-document system, which has different ordering once more of the transactions and thus slightly, very subtly different balance calculation. And that one ran on a back-end server, which was completely a different architecture than the front-end server, so it was extremely hard to actually factor out the front-end logic, which was still with EGB2, and the back-end skipped the EGB2 part, so it was actually not the same transaction model, it couldn't be externalized, so they did it again in some way, could reuse some logic, but in the end it was such a mess. And I joined the project and I was assigned with, with this assignment. The bank came again and said, folks, we have this brilliant idea. What if, because you know, probably the same in France with banks, what if, because the only relevant balance on your balance sheet is the one at the end of the day. Banks distinguish between intraday uh, stuff and intraday stuff. So. At the end of the day, you have a fixed balance. That is uh, accountability. Um, in your accounting, this is relevant. But all the balances within a day are actually virtual. They are not really existent. They're just indicative. So if you do some trading and stuff like that, it might be interesting to know exactly more or less in which direction you're going. But um, in most of these models, the only balance that counts is that at the end of the day. Now, since we have the liberty of changing those balances intraday, why don't we just do it this way? We just add up all the positive transactions first, then subtract all the negative ones afterwards within a day, and this will decrease the possibility of the user or the customer ever going below zero, just slightly. So psychologically, he will feel better about himself, right? So the day he receives his uh, salary in the afternoon, he knows already in the morning, he goes shopping for five million euros and he gets the 5 million euros in the afternoon, he will see only 5 million plus and then zero again. Instead of minus 5 million and then plus zero again. So psychologically, this was very important to the bank. Always these uh, funny requirements, right? And I had the hugest horror of my professional life. Can you imagine touching all those systems, and the e-document system was the worst, because that was actually the only system that had any legal uh, aspect to it, because those documents, once they are PDF uh, delivered to the customers, well, they're out there. You can't just change that balance anymore. It's not on the screen in your e-banking, it's out there, and it's a legal document that the customer has 30 days to, to say, oh, this was wrong, the balance is not right. So if you're ever doing e-banking, you know everything that has to do with the balance is always in the blocker. If you can't log in, that's probably a critical bug. But if the balance is wrong, that's a blocker and the, the whole system is void, more or less, at least at this case. So I thought, wait a second, I think there is a SQL feature for this. If I can just write a view, a single view, that does the calculation for me, I can join the view to all the other views. Now all I need is an association of transaction ID and balance. I only need this. And then whenever I need the balance, I just join this new view. I create new views that have the balance already inside them, and thus it will be completely transparent to all the, uh, the, the different layers. They will select from the table anyway. They won't notice if it's this table or that table. They will have the correct balance, calculated only at one place. I could just drop all the logic, and it was correct. That's the anecdote. 
Now you might say, okay, I could have done the refactoring in Java and rewritten a nicely designed Java logic. That would have been possible. Not in this case, but in a general case it would be. But think about it this way. The balance is strictly tied to the transaction. So there's a, a relation. Like in a relational database, you have a relation between this calculated value and the ID. No matter how you filter, order by, group by, whatever you do, no matter how you sum, you always have this relation. Now, if you do this in a higher up layer, and it's not business logic, it's data logic. If you do this data logic in a higher up layer, you will have to tear this data logic throughout all your algorithms where you do sorting, where you do filtering. What happens if a customer filters? He searches for different transactions that you have a salary in their text. They will get transactions with a balance on them each of the balance that the transaction had on this day, no matter if he applies the filter or not. Now, if you had to get this correct without already having the balance, oh, you would be writing those 2,000 lines again because even if it's a well-designed design, it's complex to do. But since this data is already there in the database, you only write those five lines. In my case, in the end, it was 50 lines to have a more sophisticated view to join. And uh, there were different uh, calculated values as well, but uh, that was the anecdote. And that's why I believe you should do some of the calculation in the database. Now, in this case, the table had 2, mil two billion rows. Uh, it's the biggest table in every bank, uh, the transactions table. And uh, this, to this date, uh, it runs about 3% of the CPU time of the Oracle database they're, they're having. So it doesn't even hurt them a least bit. Even if they use it all the time, it's the first screen every user sees, it's their transactions. It doesn't matter. I don't know if you, you have to have a strong database, of course, to do that many uh, calculations in the database. It doesn't scale up vertically forever. You have to try this, but it's quite probable that it works. So this is the anecdote I tried to answer your question as well because in very simple cases you might get away with doing calculations in Java like this but often you have a lot of UI logic, complex ordering, filtering and, and it will always get in the way. And if not the right guy or girl implements the change, well they will copy paste again and you're screwed again. And with only five lines there's no, no uh, risk of copy paste. You don't have to agree. It's just uh, my personal experience and opinion. I have not seen all the systems out there. But I believe that many things should be done in SQL because it's so awesome. And now we're going to show you the most awesome features of them all. If you're using Oracle, beware of the model plot. So, this one is going to be a beast. I'm going to go through it slowly. I'm not going to expect you to understand this or explain it in a way that you can write it afterwards. You better read the white paper from Oracle. It has an incredible amount of features. I'm only presenting you about 5% of what it can do. But the idea of the model clause is I have a table expression from where I have this uh, set of data and then I can transform this set in memory. Everything happens in memory. I can transform it with model and then I have a couple of other uh, clauses like the partition by clause which we've already seen. This one is easy to understand. I only want to operate on uh, rows that are in the same partition as the one that I've selected before. It wouldn't be necessary in this case because I only select one partition anyway. But if I selected not, uh, not just my account but every account then the partition by would be very useful. Now, I have this dimension by clause. Now, with this dimension by clause, I generate a set of row numbers with the window function. Again, as we've seen before, I want to enumerate all the transactions. I'm going to explain afterwards why it's called dimension. Then we have the measures clause. These are the three values that I want to calculate on each row that I'm producing. I'm also going to explain what measures means afterwards. The important part is the rules clause. With the rules, I can specify a set of rules like these in a non-relational, non-declarative way. It's kind of imperative 
like a regular imperative programming style, where I declare that my measure balance at row number bigger than one, at any row number that is bigger than one, should equal to the equation on the right. Now the equation on the right reads the balance at the current value, CV is current value, they shouldn't have abbreviated this because it's horrible to read in a larger context, but the balance of the current value of row number, which is the value that has been generated on the left side of the equation, minus one, minus the amount of the current value of the row number, minus one. So if you remember correctly, does this look familiar? So I'm taking all the rows, except the first one, so ignore the rows in Excel. I have also a row with labels. Ignore the label row. We don't take row number number one, because we already have the current balance. We have pre-calculated it. We take all the other rows below it and apply this formula. Model is actually, every time you want to do something in Excel, because you know you can, and it would be awesome, you could use model in Oracle. Because model is the spreadsheet function of the Oracle database. I usually have exactly one use case per year where I know this is the one for model. I have to use model now. Everyone hates me afterwards when I leave the team again. I'm going to do consulting. Because it's hard to read. But uh, the idea here is really dimension is what you see in, in Excel. So the vertical line is the dimension. You see that? The y-axis is the dimension. You can have as many dimensions as you want. It's even more fascinating than Excel. You can have multi-dimensional spreadsheets. So usually you have just one dimension, but you can have more. And we go further. The measures are the values in each cell. So even better than Excel, which has only one value per cell, you can have more than one value per cell. You can have n values per cell. So here, in this case, I have three. This is just a trick. I mean, validate an amount. I'm just taking the values that I have had before. I don't modify them. I only modify the balance. But in each cell, I have three values. So this is a bit tough. Every time I actually have a use case for model, I hit the books again and read it up. I can't remember this stuff, but it's really awesome. I've seen people do Sudoku solvers with model about 50 lines of model. So a SQL statement of 50 lines, you can do a Sudoku solver. I've seen people draw Christmas trees and things like that with model, although you can also do it with window functions. Crazy stuff. There's a blog, um, I forgot the name of the blog, but if you, if you Google SQL Happy New Year, you find uh, very interesting things like these that are probably never going to production, but are fun to do. And do you think it performs? You hope? It does. If you ignore what I said in the beginning, this is not as fast as it could get. It took a bit slow, uh, longer than the window functions. Maybe it's because I have Oracle Express in my laptop. Maybe I could optimize it. Maybe it's a bit slower. It's probably not as fast as window functions. But it is often very, very fast. And the thing is, you can do very fancy stuff with model. I mean, the Sudoku solver is too fancy, but one real use case was uh, I once had to do is a report that never was allowed to go below zero. So when you add up sums, it goes up and up. When it goes down, at zero, it should be cut. Just ignore any value that goes below zero and then go up again. There is no real mathematical function that can model this in an easy way. So there is no, well probably there is, but uh, my math is not good enough. With an if-else statement or a case expression, it's very easy. So you can just say, in the rule set, the calculated value of the one below, uh, above, it, if it went below zero, just ignore it and, and, and cut it at zero. And with, zero. Huh? What's zero value? No, I used the case expression. Perhaps you could use, no, uh, no max wouldn't be, the, you mean greatest, maybe. There is greatest, you can have several values to greatest and take the greatest. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you meant probably in, in uh, Java. Yeah. yeah. In SQL, it's called greatest. Okay. Yeah. Maybe I even did it with greatest. So, the model is uh, Oracle's most powerful and underused feature. I don't think it ever goes into the SQL standard as it is today. That's uh, before Oracle 12C came out. Today, Match recognizes the most powerful and underused feature. So, if you believe this was black magic, then you, I suggest you sometime read up on Match Recognize. I've never tried it yet. I've never gotten a hold of um, Oracle 12C to play around so far. Um, what it does, though, is uh, if you ever have a time series problem, this one, this beast is going to be awesome for you. You can do time series with models, so what time series means is, let's imagine you have three events, bank uh, fraud system, so you want to de detect fraud, you have three logins from a user within a period of one week, and each login, you assume that they did one payment, and then suddenly afterwards, he did one payment five times as high, three times in a row, and then again, something else over a period of five weeks maybe. So you have these kind of complex rule sets over a period of time in your data and you could do it also with a recursive SQL if you're daring and it will never perform within a day. But with match recognize you can do something like a regular expression. You can say okay this thing three times, this thing any time, this thing only once and then you can declare rules for each kind of uh, event and this is extremely powerful. Extremely powerful. I guess Oracle had a very important customer to actually implement this thing, and probably model was only uh, prepared to actually help build match recognize in the end. But some of these features are just awesome, and they're the best ways to solve these things. Match recognize in this example, I don't have an example today, but when you have the problem, you could probably implement it somehow else. But this thing that I just told you would be a 10-liner in Oracle SQL. And the thing with these things is, and again, back to the anecdote, business rules will change all the time, especially in these ad hoc use cases. So this is kind of a report. And then suddenly you think, okay, but I have to have these five different types of events, and actually everything was wrong. I just want to remodel everything in my fraud detection. And if you write the algorithm yourself, instead of just declaring it, then it will be working forever to get it right. So, soon wrapping it up, our vision at Data Geekery, SQL dominates database systems. SQL is very expressive. We've seen the most expressive one with the model class. And SQL is type safe. And it's also a device whose mystery is only exceeded by its power. I guess after the model class, we can agree with that. Normally I have a little product presentation here, you've already heard it. Obviously Juke also supports window functions. We've seen that, we've seen that. And if some time is left, I think it is, I want to show you the most awesome case I've done in recent time. So I'm working with our startup in a startup um, incubator or something like that in Zurich. And there are other startups there, and one of my, my, my uh, friend's startup is also in the same place, and what they're doing is, they're doing choreographies in the stadium. And they're actually doing this with IT solutions. So, uh, they imagined this to be a huge business in the end, it was actually something quite different from what they've imagined. In the end, what they're doing is sponsorship management, all of these things where the people display stuff in the stadium are, are branded, so you have a UBS and Credit Suisse on, written on the backs of these things. And they're the first ones to do it in tennis and all of those sports where people are kind of uh, not so fan, fan not, not such big fans and then investing in, in materials as in soccer. And the fans themselves or the other teams can actually design the choreography in a, in a software uh, element. So they upload the stadium plans to the software the design, the, the picture they want to have in the stadium in the end, and in the end they make it happen. Funny idea, I thought. Now, back from the business to the technicals, this is what they do when they actually um, just deploy those things. I'm going to zoom in a little bit. 
it's all very uh, not very automatic yet. Automa uh, automatic yet. So when they go to the stadium, they have to actually put different panels on each seat, and because the fans are are, are too dumb, probably they can't just put a white and a red one because that would be too confusing. What they do is actually they print their uh, red red, white white one, or white red one on the on each uh, seat, just to be sure everyone gets the right scene and. This is the instructions that they printed, they sent to the print shop. So for each sector, row and seat, in this example I had a different uh, choreography, they have a front and the back color of the panel. And um, what you can see now is they discovered they're actually too slow when they're in the stadium to, just to, to uh, deploy all these panels. So what they'd like to have is instructions, additional instructions to the guy who actually deploys those panels to say, okay, now we will start eight times with the same configuration. So you see start eight. And now after eight you have kind of like a piece of paper in between the panels. Now we'll stop with this configuration and get ready for a start and stop of only one panel of this kind. And then you start with seven times the same panel. So I'm not sure if this makes any sense in their business. This wasn't the interesting part for me. The interesting part for me is how can I help them do that automatically? And this was with Excel. Um, in, the, in that case, I, I probably could have done it with Excel, but I thought, let's import the data in Postgres and find a nice little query to actually calculate those two columns. Are you ready? Okay. So it was actually a, a kind of contest between me and the CTO of the company. The CTO tried to do something with R. I mean, I think he's still doing it. But, uh, no, I'm just kidding. He actually, he actually found a very nice solution as well, but he wasn't as quick. Because uh, with R it was a bit more difficult than with SQL. And with SQL I did it like this. So we have a couple of very interesting features here that are only available in Postgres. They're actually in the SQL standard but only Postgres ever implemented them. What we have here is, first off, we have a row constructor in the, in the common table expression. So what I want to do is, I want to have all the four bits of information in one column, because I always want to operate on those four bits as a unit. So I create this ad hoc tuple, which I call the block. And then I can use the lead and lag window functions to compare blocks with each other. So what I'm doing is, lag is a window function, so when you use it, when you remember the window, it's just how many elements you want to go back in the window. So lag is extremely useful, lead is just the opposite, you go ahead. So when you want to see what is the next row, according to the current order by clause, what will be the next value of this row in the current row? Try to do that with uh, nested selects or whatever. This is extremely useful, especially for these kind of things. So you can intercalate uh, values very easily. Now, I don't remember exactly why I used distinct from. Perhaps equal wasn't possible, or perhaps I had nulls. Because is distinct from actually gets rid of all the null uh, problems. When you write is distinct from, null is not distinct from null. One is distinct from null. One and two are distinct, one and one are not distinct. So this is only implemented in Postgres as well. It can be emulated with a case expression, but this is very useful. Whenever you don't want to use the null problematic, just use is distinct from. MySQL also has an operator for that with a smaller angle bracket, smaller, equal, bigger. So it's like an arrow to have that as is distinct from. So, I'm comparing when, when the, row, uh, the block behind me is distinct from the current block and the block ahead of me is also distinct from the current block, then I have a start-stop event. Very obvious, no? When that's not the case, then when the block behind me is distinct from my block, then I have a start event. Otherwise, when the block ahead of me is distinct from the current block, I have a stop event, and in the last case, I just don't have any event. Very nice. 
And the other thing that is only implemented in Postgres and in Sybase SQL Anywhere is this window class. So I thought, I said before, the only place where you can have variables in SQL are common table expressions. For some reason they thought, okay, window uh, clauses are also a very nice thing to have variables for, even if uh, hardly anyone knows about window functions. <laughs> they should have probably uh, implemented variables for expressions first, so that you can reuse them in select, group by, and order by, but they didn't do it, they uh, actually implemented it there. So in Postgres, as you see before, I reused the same order by clause for the window function four times, so I don't have to type it, I can just declare window O is my window. So that's it, and the count is a very easy window function, count star over the partition. The partition is the whole block. I think I couldn't use the block for some reason here as a partition by argument. Or maybe I could have. But the idea is I just count how many elements are in the same block as me using partition. And that's it. Quite simple. I could implement these instructions. Could have been done with other use uh, tools, obviously, but in this case it wasn't even a business requirement that had to be done in some software, and SQL is really awesome for these kind of ad hoc reports. I put some CSV in, I got some CSV out, re-import re in Excel, and done. So window functions, I guess, after tonight will be the big win for you guys. And since you're all using Postgres, try working with them, play around with them. There are many of them, and they're all awesome. And extremely useful and fast. So I want to remind you again that all of this knowledge is also available online, on the blog, on Twitter. And that's it folks. Thank you very much.